Intel launched their first 14 nanometer desktop CPU, codenamed Broadwell, in late 2014. And even though they started talking about the 10 nanometer CPUs that would follow it up shortly thereafter, it has taken them seven freaking years to get to today's launch. Alder Lake, formerly designated as Intel 12th Gen Core Processors, led by the flagship Core i9-12900K with a hybrid design. 16 cores total, split between eight performance cores with hyper-threading at up to 5.2 gigahertz, and eight efficiency cores without hyper-threading that can run at 3.9 gigahertz, making for 24 threads total and a launch from Intel that is, after seven really long years, good. Intriguing, interesting, an actual leap forward even. It is all of these things, and I am so very happy to share my performance numbers with you guys today, and to welcome competition back to the desktop CPU market. I'm just not sure whether to thank Intel or AMD. Excellent! Today's video is brought to you by Be Quiet, maker of premium PC components, but you don't have to pay a premium price to access their gear. Consider the PureBase 500DX case, available in black or white with tasteful RGB accents, and three PureWings 2 140mm fans included. The PureRock Slim 2 CPU cooler is a huge step up from stock cooling, handling up to 130 watt TDP processors with a whisper quiet 92mm fan, and the PurePower 11FM power supply lineup is fully modular and 80 plus gold rated to silently power your rig for years to come. For more on be Quiet's family of products, click the sponsor link in the video description. There are six 12th gen Intel Core desktop CPUs launching today. The 10 core 16 thread 12600K and KF, the 12 core 20 thread 12700K and KF, and the 16 core 24 thread 12900K and KF, which have 1000 unit tray prices of $564 and $589 respectively. Retail prices are about $60 over that, with the 12900K selling for $650 on Newegg right now, placing it right between the $550 12 core 24 thread Ryzen 950. 9900X and the $750 16 core 32 thread 5950X. Alder Lake CPUs have been rumored for a long time and formal announcements have already shared many of the relevant details such as support for DDR5 memory and PCI Express 5.0. So I will link some articles and further reading in the description below if you're not up to speed on all that information and plow ahead with my performance testing. My MO today is to see what these chips can do with as few limitations as possible. So I've assembled test systems with high-end hardware, installed Windows 11 with all the latest updates, drivers, and patches, and enabled multi-core enhancement and adaptive boost for Intel platforms and precision boost overdrive and auto OC for AMD to make sure we're running full throttle while also staying within reasonable limits for most home users with similar configurations. Here are my comparison CPUs for today. I'm comparing Intel's two best desktop CPUs from their mainstream platform, the 8-core 16-thread 11900K that launched in March of this year, and the 10-core 20-thread Core i9-10900K that launched in 2020. For AMD representation, we have the top three SKUs, the 16-core 32-thread 5950X, the 12-core 24-thread 5900X, and the 8-core 16-thread 5800X that can currently be purchased for less than $400. Here's a quick look at the three test beds I set up, and for consistency, I've used these parts across all the systems. The power supply, a Corsair AX1600i 80 Plus Titanium unit, the GPU, an NVIDIA RTX 3090 Founders Edition, and the CPU cooler, the 360mm Corsair H150i Elite LCD, which is LGA1700 ready. The fans were set to 90%, and the AIO was positioned to push air across the motherboard VRMs for consistency. For memory, the AMD X570 and Intel Z590 test beds ran a 32 gigabyte G-Skill DDR4 3600CL16 kit. And for Alder Lake, we're on DDR5 with the G-Skill Trident Z5 RGB kit running at DDR5 6000 with CL36 timing. Our motherboards are the Asus ROG Maximus 13 Hero for the Intel 10th and 11th gen, the Asus ROG Maximus Z690 Hero for Intel 12th gen, and the MSI X570 Ace for AMD. And yes, all the systems have RGB lighting, so they all equally get the bonus RGB performance. The remaining set of details can be seen here if you're interested. And now let's go over some performance numbers. Here are the speeds each CPU was running at. I'm showing the peak frequency each CPU hit across all tests, the average frequency during moderate use, and the sustained all-core frequency under a heavy synthetic load with the IDA64 stress test. Thanks to MCE for Intel and Auto OC for AMD, all CPUs are running about 100 to 150 megahertz above stock, with the AMD CPUs getting to 
about five gigahertz, and the Intel's hitting 5.2 on the 12900K and 5.3 on the 10th and 11th gen parts. The 11900K in particular was exhibiting some of the issues that caused many reviewers to pan it back in March though, throttling from 5.1 gigahertz all core to 4.9 and sometimes below that due to thermal limits, which we'll look at momentarily. Also of note, the efficiency cores on the 12900K were under full load during the Ida64 test two, running at 3.7 gigahertz across all eight cores. Here are my thermal comparisons showing the average and peak temperatures after the 10 minute Ida64 stress test. Here again, it should be pointed out that the Intel 11900K hit TJ Maxx multiple times, peaking at 100 degrees Celsius, then dropping its frequency to 4.7 to 4.9 gigahertz to cool off. This resulted in a reasonable average temperature, but it's not a configuration I would want to run long term. The AMD CPUs, meanwhile, did get warm, hitting about 86C max on both the 5900X and 5950X, while averaging just a couple degrees below that. You'll likely want a good high-end air cooler or all-in-one for any of these CPUs if you want to run them in this configuration long term, but the 12900K does have an edge here in overall temps, as well as headroom for overclocking or using a less capable cooler. For power draw, I have three values. I'm showing the peak CPU package power as reported by Hardware Info and measuring the wattage drawn by the entire system to show an average during the Blender BMW render and peak overall system power draw. Here is one of the first big indicators of Intel's progress with 12th gen. 100 watts less peak system power, about 70 watts less sustained, and an 80 watt drop in package power versus the 11900K, all while putting up the performance numbers that I'll be getting to in just a second. The efficiency benefits of AMD's seven nanometer manufacturing process are still holding up if you're comparing to Team Red though, with the 5900X sitting just below and the 5950X sitting just above the 12900K's results. These values can vary significantly with more conservative power limit settings though, so this isn't the final word on efficiency, but the lead that AMD has enjoyed since the Ryzen 3000 series launched has been drastically reduced, if not equalized. And now for the benchmarks, starting with Cinebench R23, where there are two stories to tell. Well, there will be two stories to tell for all of these. There's Intel versus Intel and their gen over gen improvements, and then there's Intel versus AMD for pragmatists who are trying to make a buying decision. Intel versus Intel here is the big wow though. 27,360 points for the 12900K, that's 70% faster than the 11900K, which again, just launched in March. I'm glad I didn't recommend that CPU to anyone. It's a similar boost versus the 10900K2 and 23% faster than the 5900X. It still can't quite catch the 32 thread 5950X, which remains just over 6% ahead, but the 5950X also costs 15% more, 750 bucks instead of 650. Here's the single thread Cinebench R23 test and the 12900K broke 2000, hitting 2010 points. That's 20% faster than the 11900K, the previous champ in single threaded performance, and about 24% faster than the 5900X and 5950X. This is arguably the most important metric for gaming performance, and the gains here are clearly why Intel was so confident in their statements about gaming performance prior to launch. Also, it's just so refreshing to see a new Intel part with this much of a jump versus last gen, given what they trickled out during the aforementioned seven years of 14 nanometer CPUs. Let's move on to CPU Mark 10.1, which is part of the Passmark performance performance test suite and runs a series of workloads including integer math, compression, physics, and encryption to determine overall performance. The 12900K scoring just shy of 45,000 points is quite impressive and again a leap forward in performance 54.5% faster than 11th gen and 75.7% faster than 10th gen. The 12900K also beats the 5900X by about 8% but loses to the 5950X by 10%. One add-on to this benchmark is that you can set the number of cores, so for those interested in how just the P cores perform. They scored 38,787 with the test limited to 16 threads, which I confirmed were being assigned to the P cores by checking load measurements with hardware info. Adding the E cores improved that result by 16%. The CPU Mark single threaded test again shows off the 12900K's lead, scoring more than 500 points higher than the second place 11900K, a 15% advantage. The next closest competitor is the 5950X, which is 15.5% slower. Blender is next, a free and open source 3D creation suite for modeling, animation, simulation, and rendering. We're using the open data tool to run the standard suite of five tests and showing elapsed time to complete the run, so faster is better. And while the 5950X is still tough to beat with its full complement of 16 cores and 32 threads, the 12900K was only about 13% slower and the only other CPU to finish in less than 16 minutes. That makes it 12.5% faster than the 5900X and also 55% faster than the 11900K. Next, we have video transcoding via handbrake 
music using a 4 minute 39 second 4K 150 megabits per second H.264 10 bit video clip as a source and transcoding it to 1080 H.265 with the fast preset. The encoding speed is shown as a frame rate and at 59.5 frames rendered per second, the 12900K is the flat out winner here, besting the 5950X by 12% and topping the 11900K by 46.5%. This makes me want to see the 12900K go head to head against the Apple M1 Max, which specializes in video encoding and transcoding tasks, but let's not get distracted. Speaking of popular content creation apps, we have the Adobe Suite next, starting with Photoshop, and I'm testing the 2021 version with the Puget Systems benchmark extension. The 2022 Adobe Suite update dropped just this past week, but I didn't want to risk any possible compatibility or bug issues. The 12900K scored 1,337 points though, which I thought was fun. That's 21.6% faster than the 11900K and about 15% faster than the 5900X and 5950X. Here's Adobe Premiere Pro 2021, also testing with the Puget Systems benchmark extension. And this time the 5950X edged out the 12900K, but only by about 1.7%. The 12900K was still 15.5% faster than the 11900K though, continuing the 12th gen dominance over the CPUs that Intel launched just eight months ago. Finally, we have Adobe After Effects. And remember what I said about the possible bug or compatibility issues? Even using the 2021 version, I encountered a repeatable bug with the 12900K and this test run that I haven't quite figured out. So I left this test out of the cumulative results and I'll be coming back to it in the future. I did have good runs for the rest of the CPUs though. So here's those numbers if you want to take a look. Moving on, we have the new version of V-Ray 5.01, which is a software solution by Chaos Group that helps artists and designers create photo reel, imagery, and animation for design, television, and feature films. Their benchmark package spits out a result in V-samples. And here are the 16 full cores provided by the 5950X make it about 18% faster than the 12900K. We again have insane gen over gen performance versus the 11900K though, with the 12900K managing a 52% win. The Corona renderer is a modern high performance photorealistic renderer available standalone or as a plugin for 3D Studio Max or Cinema 4D. And again, we're looking at time to render, so lower is better. The 5950X comes out on top again here by a margin just shy of 20%, and the 12900K was 52% faster than the last gen 11900K. I like the 7-zip benchmark because it's one of the more common tasks you can do with a computer, basic file compression and decompression using the 32 megabyte dictionary size setting. The 12900K edges out the 5950X in the compression test, hitting 125,862 million operations per second, which is about 2% faster than the 5950X and a whopping 49% faster than the 11900K. For decompression, the 5950X wins out due to its core and thread count again and was 53% faster. The 5900X also picks up a win over the 12900K here as it is 19% faster. Now let's check out a handful of gaming benchmarks and see if the 12900K's single core uplift results in better gaming performance. I'm running all the games except 3D Mark at 1080p, a relatively lower resolution where CPU performance will make a difference in the frame rates we achieve, and we're running a stock RTX 3090 Founders Edition GPU. 3D Mark Time Spy Extreme is a synthetic benchmark from 3D Mark. It's a DirectX 12 test, and here the 3090's graphics score did not vary much between CPUs because it's at a higher resolution and therefore more GPU bound. It does show that when CPU limitations aren't a factor, usually at higher resolutions like 4K, you should get performance like this within a couple percentage points regardless of the CPU. That said, there's also a CPU only test in this benchmark, and here the 5950X was 11% faster than the 12900K, while the 12900K was about 4% faster than the 11900K from last gen. Meanwhile, Shadow of the Tomb Raider is running in DirectX 12 mode and showing some nice gains over last gen. 203.8 FPS is 14% faster than the 11900K and 5 to 12% faster than the AMD 5000 series processors. Total War Three Kingdoms is also using DirectX 12 and we're running the Dynasty mode benchmark. Performance results are all within about five FPS of each other, however, or one to 2%, which makes me wish I had used the campaign benchmark, which usually results in more disparity between CPUs. This is a good reminder though, that not all games are CPU limited and particularly at higher resolutions can show remarkably similar performance even on different platforms. Here's a look at Civilization VI performance using the Gathering Storm AI benchmark, where CPU capabilities are determined by AI turn time rather than how many frames it can squeeze out of a GPU. 
The 12900K comes up with another win here, allowing you to make your next move 10% more quickly than the 11900K and about 11% faster than the 5900X. Rounding things out with Far Cry 6 and Intel wins again. The 12900K was 8.2% faster than the 11900K here, 13.6% faster than the 5900X, and 12.9% faster than the 5950X. It also had superior 1% low numbers as a bonus. And that's all for the compute and gaming benchmarks, so let's sum up the performance. And a big welcome to everyone who just jumped straight to this part of the video. I see you. Here are my aggregate scores across all tests, starting with compute performance. I'm showing gaming performance here too for comparison, but sorting by compute. I'm using the 5900X as the 100% baseline, and based on my tests, in terms of compute power, the 12900K hues closer to the 5950X than the 5900X, making it a more compelling all-around CPU versus just another attempt by Intel to say, best gaming CPU, while ignoring AMD's competing high core and thread count options. As for gaming, the differences are smaller, and I also want to reiterate that this was a limited number of tests, but Intel clearly has a winner with close to a 9% win over the 5900X and the 11900K. The 5950X comes a little bit closer and also has the advantage in compute performance, but for now it's also $100 more expensive, which might factor into a buying decision. Here's a final chart with pricing as well because it helps to have it all on one page, and it might be strange to say, but I feel like all these prices are competitive, minus the now outdated 10th and 11th gen Intel CPUs, Intel made a good call not trying to overprice the 12900K and match the 5950X's $750 price tag, because in this strange new world where buying a CPU is a tough decision, that makes it a tougher decision. And again, a competitive price from Intel given the current landscape. So to sum up, Intel is back. I'm not sure what took them so long. I wish they hadn't strung us along for so long with incremental updates to 14 nanometer CPUs, but this time around, 12th gen, they have retaken the single core performance crown from themselves admittedly, but done it with a chip that is actually and objectively also good otherwise, unlike the 11900K. Whether you're considering power draw, gaming, raw compute performance, or new technologies like PCIe 5.0, DDR5, and hybrid core design, the 12900K makes a compelling argument for itself, and for now is the new undisputable king of gaming PC performance. I will be back soon with more coverage though, looking at the 12600K next, and also hopefully the 12700K if Newegg comes through with my order. So please, leave me your feedback with what you'd like to see in follow-up videos. Overclocking, DDR5 versus DDR4, iGPU performance. I really hope you guys have enjoyed this video though. It took a lot of time to get all these benchmark numbers. I will put very important links to click down in the description. And if you have comments, I would be interested to read those as well. So let me know if you're surprised at how well the 12900K performs, or if you're expecting more or less. Uh, subscribe to my channel as well. If you haven't already, check out my store at paulshardware.net for shirts, mugs, other cool stuff that you can buy. Hit the thumbs up button on your way out if you enjoyed this video, and we'll see you in the next one.